<laughs> thank you, Mace. <clears throat> yeah, and thanks everyone. What a great way to get going um, in celebration. Some, some of you know that tomorrow is actually the Tibetan New Year, it's Losar. So very auspicious time and um, yeah, we need all of the points of light that we can have. And, you know, I, I really do love this celebration of um, birth for myself. It, it feels like a time when I can um, receive the love from those around me. It's a, it's a great one. Um, I, I do want to mention um, a couple of things, actually, something that has uh, just come up recently. So sorry, I didn't have a chance yet to get it. Um, into the newsletter, but I hope to do so next week. Some of you know Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche, and he has a Sangha, Lingcha, Lingchima Sangha, and they um, are organizing to do uh, an international day of prayer um, across all of the globe for the Ukraine. Uh, they're currently opening up their centers in Poland and in Hungary for refugees. Their goal is to raise $100,000 for refugees uh, on that day. Um, and so I've offered to, uh, with anyone who is interested here, it is the time difference and the way <clears throat> we'll be practicing is just for half an hour on Monday at 9 a.m. Um, so I, when I get the rest of those details, I don't have them all. I just heard um, from Rinpoche earlier this evening. Um, I would be so honored for anyone who can join and to spread that message. It feels so good to be in Sangha and to be responding to the Bodhisattva call in some way to our brothers and sisters over on the other side of the world right now. Um, we also have a, some of you might have sat with, sat before with Tempa, Lobsong Tempa. Uh, he's a monastic and a friend and sometimes Sersko Dharma Collective teacher. Uh, he reached out today to say that uh, he, he is Russian um, and trying to get one of the last flights out of Russia that's possible and asked for myself uh, to hold him in prayers with a clamp down in, in Russia across the board. He's been a little bit worried about his freedom as a monastic living there and um, someone who's public. So I will be holding him in prayers if you know him and, and that feels appropriate to just offer some energy, I think. I just feel so fortunate we have a Sangha because this is what we do with one another, right? With our, our global friends and community who we don't know, uh, and then with the folks that we do know. So I think it's a, a meaningful opportunity. And this evening, we're going to continue with this beautiful book, of course, many of you know. And we are on this chapter that is, um, Chandra and I were talking last week about her teaching on understanding the nature of mind. She said that it really was a rich experience for everyone here. So I was so, um, yeah, so happy to hear about that and so happy to continue on this unbelievably important topic of understanding the nature of mind. I have a, a couple ideas for us. Understanding the nature of mind is so deceptively simple. And truly that word simplicity actually comes up a lot in the practice. Just rest in the simple nature of mind. And that sounds very alluring. And yet how to actually get there, wow, can feel very daunting. There's, I, I love the passages that are included in this chapter, all of them, almost all of them, I think have something really unique to offer us. And in preparing for the class tonight, I was really thinking about the different methods to recognize the nature of mind. And in our meditation, we're actually gonna go through three practices. The hope here is that with one of them, there might be that direct knowing. I am confident that each of us has known the nature of mind many times. Maybe we didn't recognize it as such. Maybe we've known it in meditation and, and have that sense of presence and stillness and clarity all at once. But I think if we can just keep getting those glimpses and recognize it as nature of mind, it'll really increase our confidence 
and then increase our engagement. And I think that creates a real virtuous cycle. So tonight, the three practices we'll, we will do, because you know there are many ways to explore and connect with the nature of mind, is <clears throat> we will do a really simple practice of counting. And the counting practice, right, it goes one, and we will do it. I will actually suggest that we go to 11. Sometimes it's 21, sometimes it's shorter. And when we're counting, we're really bringing our mind to such a specific focus because we do it breath by breath. So that anchor is so specific. And then at 11, I'll invite us to open into the nature of mind. So it's, we're, ta we're doing this oscillation, very narrow focus, counting breath by breath, and then just let it go. And then we'll begin counting again. So we'll do that for a little while and, and see if we can kind of feel into that nature of mind. Unconfigured, um, of course, often compared to the sky behind the clouds, this just sense of spaciousness as opposed to um, the content that arises so, so frequently. We'll then do um, a practice of labeling. It's just another way. So instead of kind of focusing and then opening, we'll wait for and watch the thoughts and sensory experiences as they arise. And we'll use very simple labels. So thinking or sensory experience. That could be hearing, that could be physical sensation. Maybe we can even, you know, something comes through the window and we catch a smell. Just so that we know when we are labeling something that is passing through this unconfigured nature of mind and then the experience of the nature of mind. And we will, as one teacher said, I wish I could remember who, but I loved it. We will mine the gaps. <laughs> so the gaps in between our thoughts, our sensations, the sounds, those little gaps, that nature of mind, that's where we will hang out. And then I'll invite us to experience that. So we've kind of like given ourselves some, some rungs on the ladder, right? Kind of getting ourselves towards that nature of mind. To then settle into noticing the nature of mind as a full embodied experience. Often we think of the nature of mind of like, let's go, you know, somewhere behind the eyes, between the ears. There's something spacious there. And yet what I've, I've noticed for myself and, and maybe many of you as well is that's not the only location of the nature of our mind and that we can experience it in a full bodied way. And I think it's, again, just another inroad. So possibly for some of you, the counting is going to be it. You're going to really get that flavor, that taste for others, maybe the labeling and for others, the embodiment. And maybe for someone, all of them work but we'll begin our practice by almost as though we could imagine uh, sweeping the hearth. So for me, <laughs> there's a lot of things in between me and the, my true nature of mind. And, and a lot of it is what I've come with here today. All of us have had some kind of day. Maybe many of us have engaged with the news, personal, global. And so we'll start with a bit of a handshake practice so that we can just be with what's here. I, I find for myself in practice, a lot of the obstacles to really resting in that clear nature of mind is this kind of subtle body experience of my emotional material. So that is our journey. I wanted to share it with you so you had a sense. And I'm gonna read us just one passage before we begin our meditation together. So this is a, a passage, we'll come back to it. It's Nyendrak Lungrig Nima on 166. Just a really beautiful set of prose on how we try to get closer to and experience this nature of mind. It is hard to put an end by force to the continuous chain of thoughts. But if when they occur, their nature is recognized Thoughts have no choice but to be liberated in their own sphere. 
without pursuing past thoughts or inviting future thoughts, remain in the present moment and simply recognize the nature of whatever arises in your mind. Relax in simplicity, free of intentions and attachments. Although there is nothing to meditate on, remain fully present without getting distracted, getting used to the way things occur of themselves without altering anything. Primordial wisdom, self-luminous will arise from within. How is this so, you might ask? If you leave cloudy water undisturbed, it will naturally become clear. Most other meditations are only temporary ways to calm the mind. The space of great unchanging emptiness and the simple luminosity of uninterrupted wakeful presence have always been inseparable. You must yourself experience that essential thing, which is within you. No one can do it for you. So let's endeavor to find our way to the simplicity of mind by finding a posture that can support us for this practice. Maybe we give ourselves a little bit of entry into the body by inhaling our shoulders up to our ears and then gently exhaling them down our back. And twice more. Exhale. Inhaling, rising, and then feeling maybe a slight lift of the chest upward. Finding a tall spine and the dignity of that tall spine. arranging our hands in a way that is comfortable, either folded in our lap or resting on our thighs. For this first part of the practice, inviting the eyes to be gently closed or softly focused in front of you. And find the head resting evenly on top of the neck, just the slightest downturn of the chin. Soften and release and soften and release through the face, the chest, the belly. and lengthen and strengthen through the back. And find the breath. Allowing your attention and breath to travel together. Following the breath as it travels in through the nostrils. And as it releases.
And taking a moment here to recognize that you have arrived and showed up. And considering your intention and motivation for arriving here this evening. Letting this intention be like a lantern, really filling ourselves with light and clarifying what we are here to do, to dedicate ourselves to practice, to enable ourselves to be more of service, interconnected with this entire wonderful planet. Allowing the intention to fall a bit to the background, still with us. But now directing our attention and awareness to the field of the body. Noticing our sensations of being seated or possibly lying down, a sense of being supported. And then peel back one layer of sensation. And notice in the body, the residue of the day, maybe of the week. Day to day, hour to hour, we experience emotions. Pleasant and unpleasant of such great variety. And some of them get a bit sticky. They come with us. And without needing to elaborate or create a story, just notice and be with any residue of our emotions that might be in the body. Tuning in and noticing these areas of sensation. For many of us, this might be a clenching in the shoulders or a heaviness in the chest or belly. Tension, different areas of the face, the neck. And as we're attending to these locations, we notice with curiosity and kindness And as we meet or shake hands with these sensations of emotion in the body, we recognize that any sensation we're having has all the space it needs.
It's okay if the mind gets distracted or carried away. For a couple more moments, let's just continue noticing and giving space for the emotional residue. Feel or imagine a sense of tenderness and caring for what we bear in the body. Without too much of an agenda, just notice if the sensations can soften, release. Using the exhale to help gently release and relax and unwind maybe the tighter areas. Using the inhale. as a way to open, make space in these sensations. While still feeling connected to the body, we shift our attention more narrowly to focus on the breath. We'll use this practice of counting and then releasing. So counting at the very top of the inhale before the exhale from one until 11. And with that final exhale at 11, allowing the attention and awareness to expand. And for a couple breaths, seeing if there can be a connection to this simplicity, to the nature of mind just as it is. So beginning with the next inhale, beginning the count to 11, and then pausing, and then resuming.
One more round of counting, of giving ourselves that narrow focus of the number, the top of the inhale before the exhale. And then on that 11th breath, imagine opening up and just resting in the simple nature of mind. And gently shifting our attention now to the practice of labeling. Labeling thoughts and thinking. Labeling sensory experience. Feelings in the body or sounds. And noticing the gaps or the spaces between the thoughts and the sensory experiences. You can gently blink the eyes a bit open, allowing in some more light. Don't fix the gaze on anything in particular. Let it be soft. Noticing the movement of the mind, the thoughts and sensations, sound, all the sense impressions. And then notice the stillness of the mind. Labels can be quite simple. Thinking, sensing. Immediately when you notice, this has entered the mind stream.
not, <clears throat> not trying in any way to prevent thoughts or stop thoughts. Just naming them, noticing them as thoughts. And in that direct noticing, they are allowed to recede and return from where they came. Like waves returning to the vastness of the ocean. So we can simply be ocean. If you get caught up in a thought, memory, or image, no problem. Just relaxing and releasing. And then returning to this practice of labeling. And then resting in between. In the simple nature of mind. while still connecting to these spaces, these gaps, these ways of being in this nature of mind. We inhabit the space of the body more fully. And with curiosity, see if you can feel the nature of mind through the whole body. A body of open,
clear light awareness. Relaxed yet clear and vivid. The eyes have been open, gently blinking them shut. Regathering the attention to the breath. And returning to a noticing of the subtle body and anything that might have shifted and changed since the beginning of practice. Thank you for your practice. Love to hear <clears throat> any thoughts, questions, or reflections on that practice. Raise your hand to the little reactions or actual raise your hand or put anything in the chat. Jason. I, uh, first of all, thank you for the guiding because um, really helps. It's very, I appreciate the focus of that kind of guiding where it's very specific. It's like, I think my mind needs to be told what to do. Um, 
and when I am trying to tell it what to do, I realize how completely scatterbrained I am. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's it's been a very intense period of my life and there's all this stuff going on. So I'm just sitting here um, full of sensations of my mind. Like my mm -hmm. mind is basically spinning and doing all sorts of stuff. And, you know, it's, it's probably doing that all the time, but now I'm noticing it. And mm -hmm. I'm curious, like a lot of times I'll let myself just do it. Just, just spin, just go like, let the mind, because in a way that's part of the state of my mind is that and i'm it's like the I, the idea of settling it takes a while mm -hmm. and even in these in a 20 minute sit a 30 minute sit i'm not i'm, I'm like kind of touching you know and and sometimes i'm just noticing wow it's really stirred up but i wonder if you have sort of thoughts about how to handle the there's a desire that emerges the desire to calm the desire to just like I have this really keen sense of I want to do the instruction and hold on to the counting and you know really label everything and then I'm spinning off and thinking and then I'm like oh spinning off and thinking labeling it but I'm wondering if you have sort of like any any wisdom around what to what to do for example, I, I mean, this is a question that I want, I'm going, I'm going to share something that somebody told me. He said, when the thought arises, just drop it. Right. And that was, that was a Susie Harrington. I went on a, I was in a desert Island and we were really getting deep into it. And I was able to do that. I actually was like, okay, thought arises, stop mid sentence. Um, and, and that's like sort of pretty deep for me. And I'm wondering if you have other sort of, um, I hate, dare I say, talking to ourselves, like ways of talking to ourselves through this sort of unsettledness. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I'm sure you're not alone. Um, I might answer your question a little differently, I think, um, than you're asking, because <clears throat> it's some instruction, obviously, is very helpful. I, I gave a lot uh, of like little, you know, specifics it can be very easy to delude ourselves when we're start kind of coming up with strategies um, of how to talk with ourselves. And, you know, it's, I'm not sure why, but um, what came to me is uh, I also having a hard week and um, for a variety of, of different reasons. And, um, you know, sometimes I find that of course, um, there's a lot in the philosophy of meditation that is helpful for me, but actually what I needed to do was tire my body out. That works for me, right? To move in these different ways. Sometimes what I need to do is listen to just some ridiculously joyful music and like dance it out um, or, you know, hang out by my favorite tree. So I think our body can use some help sometimes to help our to help still our mind so when you said desert island i think i got a cue of mm, i wonder what else was going on there i bet there was a lot of connection with the natural world there was a lot of spaciousness so i think we we can't just put ourselves on the cushion when we got a lot going on and um and forget about in some ways like everything that not forget but the practice is is all the ways that we attend to our mind, heart, body. Um, so I, I hope that's helpful and it, 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 it'll be different for some folks. Like maybe my version of really fun, joyful music might make you feel like total despair. So it's not like a specific thing, but finding that way to engage our body uh, and our sensory experiences so that we can maybe settle more easily um, on the cushion. I want to. I want to just share one thing, which is that um, I've tended recently to want to sleep, and it's really powerful. It's almost like childlike, you know. Maybe it's some kind of trauma. I I, I don't know what it exactly is going on, but the desire to sleep when I feel overstimulated is so powerful that I'm wondering, like, how you know, I need to tell myself to do other things than just like the the comfort zone of falling asleep or just taking a nap or shutting down. So I'm going to start 
I, I like the idea of movement. I'm going to try the new things because I feel like I need to get, need to, it's spring. I need to get outside. I need to shake it out. The pandemic's going to be over, you know, time to move, maybe do something completely different. So yeah, I appreciate yeah. that. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Magnolias are blooming in the botanical gardens. A lot of ways to kind of invite that freshness. Yeah. Yeah. Let us know how it goes. Anyone else with questions or reflections on um, on the practice? I know it's not an easy practice. Um, simple and not easy. Yes, Claudia. I have a question. I wonder whether when we, if we're successful enough to reach that natural state of the mind is that is that a way of like connecting with our subconscious somehow i mean to be like so open i found sometimes that when i'm in that state all of a sudden like um i don't know how to say but i mean either ideas or if you want kind of like answers or things kind of like pop up kind of like emerge from that like the depth of the ocean and all of a sudden whoop, you know something comes up is that what happens it, it's interesting that's good noticing because that does happen <laughs> uh -huh. and it actually can almost be a distraction um because sometimes you have these like really profound memories or like fully formed thoughts, ideas, inspirations. And it's like, it's, they are, um, so that, that quality of mind, which is relaxed and spacious, it doesn't mean it's empty and vacant, right? Mm. We say emptiness in a specific way. We're not saying without content. And so I think what you're um, kind of connecting into is some of the creativity that flows there. Right. And um, subconscious is a funny one. You know, there's a back check in um, this is like these imprints. Um, that's the closest thing we get to a kind of subconscious um, way of thinking, meaning that, you know, we have these stored memories, maybe from lifetimes that influence our perception and how we see the world. But I, it, the kind of when we're in this, nature of mind when we're resting in that simplicity it isn't necessarily there's not a narrative there's not a a goal um and yet things will arise um and it, and it doesn't mean we have to feel like um again like that nothing nothing is happening but the focus is not on the activity it is on that kind of experiential um openness and and flow or, or it's funny because it's it's so hard because metaphors get mixed so quickly but again uh, one of the beautiful metaphors in this chapter is about we see the flow of the river which is like our thoughts and we don't imagine that there it's the same river every day mm -hmm. and the thoughts are changing every day and that's not our mind so so that change like that changeless timeless mm -hmm. quality that we sometimes experience when we're in that state where it's, you know, we forget who we are, where we are. There doesn't need to be a present or a past or a future. There's a timelessness. Right. And occasionally these visions, I call them visions or ideas will arise and beautiful. Sometimes on retreat, when I'm fortunate enough to have that be more common, um, I will keep a notebook just so I don't lose it because sometimes it does feel quite rich mm. not just the kind of going grocery shopping what's mm. going you know like not that like there's a different like you described it well it's almost like something got dislodged mm -hmm. and like comes to the top mm -hmm. yeah and and if i understand correctly i mean i'm not supposed to latch onto that but it but it just it, i don't i won't go into details but i've been like really concerned about certain things and all of a sudden and i've been actually even having some nightmares mm. around like six in the morning when i'm kind of like half awake and half mm. asleep and uh so i tried to breathe deep and get myself you know relaxed and 
calm down. And, uh, you know, what popped up today was like trust, mm. it's like trust and be peace. Beautiful. And yeah, I mean, I didn't, I didn't latch onto that. I mean, I didn't you just let it be, yeah. but it was like really interesting. <laughs> And wonderful. So, so beautiful. And you know, this is where Alan Wallace would say, uh, this is the mind healing itself. Uh -huh. So instead of God, I'm so anxious, I've been waking up at six, I have these nightmares, like, I just got to tell myself I'm okay, everything's okay, like, kind of this forceful way. But when you can rest in that natural state of mind, you know, it's said, like, um, if you have the cobra in knots, and it's inside of the tight basket. It's gonna stay in knots. But if we release the basket, the cobra un unwinds itself. So it's, it's like your mind unwinding itself. Beautiful. Yeah, thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. Yeah. I see in the chat here, uh, Denise saying, uh, for, first part felt fabulous, especially with the forgiving cues uh, the 11 count felt restricting and distracting tonight, though normally it would be deepening, especially the pauses. But I dropped the counting and noticed I was comfortably breathing in 11s. Yeah, great. You know, I, counting is a funny practice. Some people really don't like it, uh, don't consider it to be meditation at all. Um, I would, I would have liked to offer to you all is, is the types of practices um, I do in, in central channel breathing, but I am, I am not a, a, I'm not, I'm a practitioner, but not a teacher of those practices, but I have found that concentrative focus on the breath and in central channel, you're doing visualization and the breath that that focus just allow, you know, gives you enough space and, and clarity that then you can kind of, it's almost like the back door <laughs> to that spaciousness of mind. I think that oscillation is so key. That's a very classic teaching, this oscillation between the very tight focus and then this open focus. Um, I will share that's, that's something I have been practicing also in walking meditation. So wish maybe we can in day longs in the center in the future. <clears throat> I wish we could do walking practice together. I think it's um, very powerful to, to include that and, uh, and eating right? These core aspects of our life that we can do and bring practice to, but with walking, um, I will often do a really, really tight focus just on sensations at the feet. But then I reach the edge of where I'm walking and I open up all sensory awareness and then go right back to the feet. So those oscillations, um, so it can just be very powerful. And of course, doing them in sitting practice, but maybe also exploring if there's other ways that might be more um, supportive. Eve, what was that called again, what you're practicing? Oh, the central channel practices. So I think online, um, I've seen them taught by Reggie Ray. Um, often these are practices that are taught uh, alongside, you know, other breathing practices like TUMO. So Robert Thurman or Dr. Nita will teach these practices and it includes a visualization of your central channel, so kind of of your chakras and you use your breath with the visualization. It's a method of concentration. Um, so using the imagination and breath and it's, uh, it's simple, but I just am humble that I don't really feel like <laughs> I can teach anybody that. I'm still working on it, maybe in 10 years. Um, I can do that. Any other um, questions on the practice? Otherwise we'll read some of this beautiful passage. It's really rich to hear how this practice is um, landing and not landing for you. So please share if, you, if you'd like to. Hey Eve, I have just like 
a quick yes. question um, or just elaborate. I really thank you for the practice. I really enjoyed it. And uh, I actually really enjoyed the noting tonight. Mm. I feel like I hadn't done that in a while. And it was really interesting to, to see what was happening where I thought maybe I was pretty calm. And then all of a sudden it was like, I would think of something, something, and then like an image of a person. And then I was like in a mm. blown conversation with them and was just like, okay, <laughs> it's a lot going on, reel it in. But, um, so that was really interesting, but one, but I think you've kind of answered it in each person's response, but mm. uh, I feel like I have a really hard time with this, like emotional body and the residue. Mm. Um, like I really have a hard time identifying that and, mm. I feel like it really came up for me uh, last week. I had a particularly challenging week and, you know, it, I would have trouble sitting and concentrating. And then, um, you know, by the end of the week on like Saturday, I had like a full blown migraine and mm. you know, it was just like, friends were just like, oh, you're holding, you're holding on to the stress. And it's just like, I, you know, I was trying to move and, you know, I put a lot of time into this, you know, and self-care type things and I still just don't see you know I still don't know how to get that out or yeah not hold it and like um so I don't know if you have any yeah yeah thank you for sharing that and sorry to hear it and um I um I can relate you know I I uh there's a lot that we're asking of our bodies, you know, in terms of the the day to day volume of things we do, whether we're parents, right, and kind of holding the experience of others, and then um, if we have a work environment, and um, yeah, there's there's quite a lot that we experience, and it it is this um, tricky kind of wonderful gift to start to attune more to our bodies and minds, because I actually think it makes us realize it and we maybe are not quite as capable of just kind of efforting through, you know, like, all right, I'm just going to get through and instead recognizing and feeling, and it can be very uncomfortable. Um, so I think what can really help with the subtle body stuff and this idea of like kind of moving, um, moving some of that energy is, I, I, I want to avoid thinking like, I gotta get rid of it or I gotta like, it's gotta not be there. Um, I really like the image of channels. So that's often used that there are these channels, these subtle body channels in the body. And I like to think of it as, um, you know, the flowing and the fluidity. So there's nothing that's per se kind of wrong or bad. Of course, we don't want to, um, kind of cultivate and um, hang on to experiences like anger um, and um, jealousy or otherwise. And yet we don't need to be like, oh, I gotta get that out, that thing's in the way. Um, so with that subtle body, you know, imagine stress, for example, it's actually amazing uh, research by a friend and colleague of mine where if when you're experiencing the sensations of stress in the body, which we all know what that feels like, if in that moment we operate at a kind of reappraisal and say, wow, there's my body trying to meet the needs right now, that that in and of itself, like physiologically helps us calm down. So I, I bring that up to say in some ways, like it's really helpful to have this perception of, okay, my body's heavy with stress okay, my mind is, you know, a, a wasp nest of different ideas right now. Okay. So it's almost like our, our humility or our surrender with what's happening can help with the flow. And then, you know, you're saying of applying the self-care. And I, I do think it's, it's a little tricky because sometimes we need different things. Sometimes it's journaling. Sometimes it is like crazy loud music. Sometimes it's getting so quiet and taking naps like Jason and like, how do we actually identify um, that which is really going to be supportive and, and there's a, um, there's a bit of um, exploration. And of course, no one wants to have a migraine and be, you know, some ways incapacitated to the world, but we could also think of that as 
your body forcing you to do the rest it needs, um, not making it a problem. I feel like that's been um, such a humbling and important lesson, right? All of these texts are meet reality nakedly. And so it's a very unsatisfying answer, Karen, but I hope it's helpful just in like that attitude we bring with it. You know, you're already doing everything. And then how do we be like tender and gentle with kind of what is? No, thank you. That is helpful. And it's just one thing I think I need to keep identifying. It's still sometimes hard for me to feel that and make it all connect. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, you're so welcome. Alex, I see your hand. Yes, hi. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for being here with us and for teaching and for the guidance. Really, really, really appreciate it. Um, my question has to do with um, one aspect of even today's practice. Um, it's interesting because you were saying how some people have a really hard time with counting. And I'm actually one of the people who loves counting. Like it really works for me. I can kind of stay with the cycles, you know, for a long time. I can get concentrated. Conversely, I'm having a really hard time with kind of this one instruction that comes in different flavors. It's the instruction to like, you know, connect with a vast spacious awareness or rest your mind in awareness or even, and I apologize, I don't remember exactly how you phrased it today, but the thing that we were supposed to do on, on 11, right? Mm. Like kind of sort of ex expanding the mind and opening up. And there's, you know, I can see this part of me that really wants to do it correctly. Yeah. And yet I don't really know what the center of the bullseye is. Like right. I don't even know what I'm striving for. Yeah. And, and at the same time, I'm also like, well, but you're not really supposed to, Alex, maybe you're overthinking it. You're like, you're not yeah. supposed to be striving and making it difficult. But then I'm like, well, but then like, but what am I doing? And yeah. So I, I'm, I'm a little lost in that regard. So any guidance yeah. you could offer would be really appreciated. I love your question. That's a great question. It's such an honest question. It's such an important question. Um, and yeah, it's like so vague, right? It's so intangible. Yeah. And so it's, it, can, it can feel very elusive. And then the words to describe it, so appealing. We want it, you know, it sounds yeah. great. Um, you know what I find really, I find kind of funny, but I, I find it useful is you know, these states of this kind of unconfigured uh, state of mind or spaciousness, mm. they also happen right after we sneeze, according mm. to the ancient tradition, right? Also okay. certain forms of orgasm, but they require like quite a lot of specific practice of like breath training, <laughs> but the sneeze, and then sometimes if we're lucky when we die, I was like, okay, well, I got the sneeze one for sure. And this idea of, you know, what happens right after we sneeze is it's not Eve. I'm not really like tuned into the narrative of my past and my present and my future. And there, you know, there is, I don't know the last time you sneeze and how do you remember it, but there is kind of a, mm. and so to not make it complicated what we're looking for, you know, and I, um, I think to be able so I was like trying to like these like little glimpses even of that feeling I've often experienced it on accident I think this yeah. natural state of mind when there is like the, these two qualities together these that was for me the most helpful and kind of identifying when I can feel into it is that relaxation you know so sitting there kind of maybe in a in a posture that's that's comfortable and warm and I actually don't really have anything to do and I'm not really on my way anywhere. And there is also a clarity, like I'm not dull, I'm not falling asleep. Mm. That we can kind of, when we notice that naturally happening, it naturally happens all the time, that we really take note and really pay yeah. attention. That's why in, in the last part of the instruction to the body, because what I notice for myself when I kind of stumble into these experiences of nature of mine, my body has this very, again, hard with the words, but like rich quality. Like it's, it's a sense of like, oh, I'm really fully here, but I'm not paying attention to the fact that my ankle hurts and my body, like there's a 
it's almost like there's a lot more pixels in my body. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. not a vague picture. So that's, I hope that's helpful, but I would say like, look for it where it already is. Yeah, it's super helpful. Thank you. And it's also made me realize that maybe I um, left out kind of an interesting bit, which is, yeah. as you said, I think I've experienced it sort of, it kind of comes and goes. And so when I said like, well, I don't know what the center of the bullseye is, that's not entirely accurate. It's kind of yeah. like, I feel like I've gotten glimpses. But when I hear that as an instruction, it feels like something that I should be able to just do on demand. And yeah. I don't really like, I, it's actually like, well, I kind of see where I want to be, but I have no idea how to sort of move there from where I am right now. Yeah. And, and yet the instruction makes it seem like it should just be doable. Just yeah. kind of like rest and awareness. Um, yeah. So I don't know. That was just sort of a. No, totally. Or that. like even how to sustain it. Right. Because maybe yeah. you, there's a glimpse and then you're like, and now what? Um, and I do think, um, you know, uh, one of my, root teachers, also one of Chandra's root teachers, Alan Wallace, is just so intent on shamatha, on training our attention. And um, our focused attention is not the nature of kind of this openness. It's, it's actually this really focused mm -hmm. piece. But I do think that training our shamatha can really help us sustain that sense of open mind for longer. Okay. Oh. Well, thank you so much. I'll, I'll just yeah, keep sort of thank you. meandering yeah. my way to it. No, <laughs> great. Okay. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you again. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to take us back to page 165 here. I mean, honestly, I'll say the conversation and questions are pretty much as good as this text. Don't tell Matthew Ricard. Um, but I do like the poetry of it and hearing it in this way. So again, we're with Nyendrak Lungrig Nima. The first part of the text I read earlier, I just, I just love these next couple prose. Um, Although subject and object are not two, they appear to us as fundamentally distinct entities. And through attachment to them, we further strengthen this tendency. Samsara is nothing else but that. I'll say that one more time. Although subject and object are not two, they appear to us as fundamentally distinct entities. And through our attachment to them, we further strengthen this tendency. Samsara is nothing else but that. So this way that we create a distinction between ourselves and others, between also um, this idea of what out there might be better than what's in here, like there, like there is a separateness. That that kind of reification that kind of creates this way of thinking of of dual duality. We, you know, I've we've spoken about this here in this um, in this book already, but this. This idea of non-duality, it sounds very lofty uh, and exciting, and yet it's, it's really this simple law of interdependence and connection, and really inviting a sense of belonging to each other, to the natural world, to the cosmos. And we can do so again at that like basic particulate level. So we share DNA, like 99.9% .9 of our DNA with other people. Like this, this idea of connection as a way of thinking, as opposed to an idea of separation as a way of thinking. And then here, the simple statement that samsara is thinking we are separate. That the whole way that we try to escape from suffering towards something else that's better, that keeps us endlessly busy, never really reaching it, that's samsara. And that can only be possible if there's something out there that's different than something in here. Um, and Heidi's asking, is that another definition of emptiness? And this is, you know, I think this is the beauty, especially of these texts here is this nature of mind is a glimpse of emptiness, a glimpse of interconnection, a glimpse of what it feels like when it's not when there isn't an agenda or a to-do list, 
I really, you know, I, I mentioned this already, but for me, such a powerful teaching I received was, or I received and then I guess was able to connect with is this, um, this sense of timelessness in that unconfigured nature of mine. That sense of, I don't need to get there or, or rehash what happened. I'm like opening into this expansive now. And that really feels um, complete and just by, by nature, you know, not separate um, without forcing it. And then the next stanzas here are, while good and bad actions are devoid of true reality, by power of our intention, they produce joys and sorrows. Just as seeds of sweet or bitter plants give fruits to corresponding taste. Thus the world appears similarly to those with common karma and differently to those whose karma is different. In fact, even if one goes to hell or elsewhere, it's only a change in one's perception of the world as in dreams or things that appear do not exist. The root of all of our illusory perceptions is the mind. The nature of mind transcends the notions of existence and non-existence, eternity and nothingness. To this nature is given the simple name, absolute space. And I think what we land on here, so this idea that our good and bad actions are, are really only good and bad because of our intentions. Um, and that this perception of the world is everything because especially with this world we're living in and, and so many of the daily challenges and um, calls to action. It's like, why are, we, why are we like spending time on the nature of mind? Isn't there like more to do there in our bodhisattva action in the world? But when we really take this in that it's our perception of the world that is the world, we see how important it is. I have, I have been experiencing quite a bit of, uh, <clears throat> you know, this kind of delusional quality or upset quality. Um, and it's, it's amazing to see or kind of be able to watch the mind create a story of, oh, I've been wronged or hurt or someone hurt me or I felt, you know, that, that creation of, uh, of an event. And it's not that bad things don't happen to us, but to get caught in the story of it where our perception can turn us indeed. The root of all of our illusory perceptions is the mind. And yet the nature of mind transcends the notions of existence and non-existence, eternity and nothingness. To this nature is given the simple name of absolute space. And that doesn't mean that we need to <laughs> stop caring about relative reality. It matters. Other people matter. What's happening in the world matters. And yet we can free ourselves from some of the kind of, yeah, like hell realms of our own making. If we can just give ourselves these glimpses of this true nature of mind, it's like a refreshment. Um, let's see here. Yeah, I really like this Mipam Rinpoche. Um, passage here. This is on page 168. And this is the nature of mind, essential instructions in three points. The natural simplicity of mind is inexpressible, free and vast. It must be recognized by itself. When all mental fabrication, all conceptualization and attachments disappear naturally, we call that recognizing the essence of mind. Once freed from the net of thoughts, not losing in the continuity of the presence of the primordial nature, without acting or making effort, without seeking anything, we call that preserving meditation. When like clouds in the sky, the waves of many thoughts neither harm nor benefit the mind, which remains serene, we call that liberating, liberating the mind in its own nature. These three essential instructions will be understood by meditators who cultivate in experience, but will be incomprehensible to garrulous intellectuals. 
<laughs> I like that. Cracks me up. Um, so this idea that, again, this nature of mind and these instructions, we have to experience them for ourselves, right? As was said earlier, no one can do it for us. No one can do it for us. And I like these three, you know, it, I think there's interesting, this like recognition of the essence of mind and then preserving that and then allowing it to just really sink in like, oh my gosh, these thoughts can't hurt me. And that is just the most liberating realization. It is really, um, it's an easy one to experience intellectually, to know that our thoughts aren't real, that we can think things that can't harm us, but to really have that sink in. That's the true liberation. That's the true sense of freedom. And it's a really, um, it's a really wonderful progression there, right? So first we just get this glimpse or sense of our mind free from thoughts, okay? Notice that there's something there other than this stream of thoughts. Maybe we get like a bit more time there. And then we start living from there, which doesn't mean we don't think, we don't act, we don't interact, but it means that we see things as they are, which is so interesting. It actually, when I've had glimpses of it myself or, or periods of it, there is of course still a richness in the world. And yet there is this kind of flatness of what usually motivates. We're not trying to get this thing or get away from this thing. It's, it's a very interesting experience to have that, that liberation or that sense of reprieve. Um, yeah, as I'm speaking about it, I'm, I'm trying to understand it myself of like, how do we work with that sense of reduced investment, engagement and need that comes from longing and wanting and needing attachment and aversion, and yet still have that clear motivation to be of service to all beings, right? It's like we're, we're not experiencing this open vastness as a refuge away from the world. And yet when we see thoughts as they are, a lot of things seem kind of silly and that's, that's a good thing. There can be a lot of um, relief from the kind of ambitions of ego and identity. So it's a real, yeah, a real sweet call. And I think a lot of these texts, what they're inviting us to do is to cultivate that yearning, even to get a sense of like, okay, like maybe I'm not there or not even sure exactly where that is, but wow, that idea that sense of liberation, I want it. We have to cultivate that, that longing is so essential. Um, let's see here, I'm gonna, just one more line, because, um, yeah, I just love this. Um, on page 171, this is again, Dilgo Kense Rinpoche, who's all over this chapter. When the nature of mind is recognized, it is called nirvana. When it is obscured by delusion, it is called samsara. Just that, <laughs> just that simple. When the nature of mind is recognized, it is called nirvana. When it is obscured, it is called samsara. Yet neither samsara nor nirvana has ever departed from the continuum of the absolute. When realization of awareness reaches its full extent, the ramparts of delusion will have been breached and the citadel of Dharmakaya beyond meditation can be seized for once and for all. Here, there is no longer any distinction between meditation and post-meditation. The experience is effortlessly stabilized. This is non-meditation, the limitless expanse of Dharmakaya. So this invitation for us this evening, hopefully for the rest of our week to 
continue our meditation in our non-meditation state. Um, so I'm going to look for this, this Lingcha um, event. So when I, again, it's not yet on their website, so I can't share it quite yet. Um, but I'll at least share the main site. And then on Monday at 9 a.m., um, I will see if it's possible if we can send, send it out to folks um, and do some practice together and really support <clears throat> these efforts that are going kind of globally um, for the Ukrainian refugees right now in Poland and Hungary and Eastern Europe. Hey, Eve, uh, yeah. Noam is gone. And so I will be adjusting okay. the newsletter uh, if you need to add anything to it. So right. I don't it, know who you yeah. know the email, but um, yeah. if you email the SF Dharma Collective, I'm, I'm getting those right now and then can add it to the newsletter. Great. And that it goes out uh, Tuesday at 11. So if you can get it to me before then. <laughs> Or but I can send out an email, I guess. Yeah, I might ask you, because since it's Monday at nine, yeah, maybe we do special Yeah, one. that's totally fine, but anyway. Cool. cool. So, you know. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I, I hope hope you all can join. Um, that would be beautiful to be with Rinpoche, and um, such, he's such an interesting teacher. Maybe we can read a book by him next and uh, have him join us one evening. It's really quite an inspiration. So let's take a moment and dedicate our merit here together. So returning fully home into the body, heart, mind. And bringing forth this embodied sense of longing, of course, for our own liberation and for the true liberation that can only happen if all of us are free. So may our practice here together be of greatest benefit so that all beings could know safety and health. All beings could know belonging and freedom And all beings could have ease and love. Thank you, everyone.